You know, I was a Jehovah's Witness for 15 years, and I went about knocking on doors, which was required for my so-called salvation in the Watchtower Society. Now, generally, when we Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on the doors, we got one of three responses. Are you ready for this? And if you feel guilty, you should. One response was the fluttering curtain with the cringing coward hiding behind it, hoping that we would go away. Mm -hmm. I see a few people convicted. The second thing was, to the door comes a little child and says, Mommy says to tell you she's not at home. Mm -hmm. Bunch of liars behind the door. The third response was probably the most common one that stands out in my memory, and that was the Christian person saying to me, I don't need this, I'm saved, and slamming the door in my face. Now, as a Jehovah's Witness, that taught me two things about Christians. Number one, they had no love. And number two, I really wasn't happy deep down in the innermost part of me with what I had as a Jehovah's Witness. But surely, if they had something better, they would share it with me. Now, there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. Thank God a Christian finally did confront me on some of my Watchtower doctrine, drove me into the Word of God, I tell you, when a Jehovah's Witness starts to look in the Bible without the aid of the Watchtower publications, they're on their way out. Praise God, I came free in Christ. And then the burden of my soul was to see the Jehovah's Witnesses reached for Christ. Because why do they get into the Witnesses, Mormons, or any of these other cult groups? Why do people go in? They go in because they are hungry and seeking for God. They go in because there's some crisis in their life. They're looking for love. They're looking for acceptance. They're wondering, why am I here? Is this life all there is? Does God care about me? And if during this seeking time a Christian would come with them and share Jesus Christ, they would be in your church today. But because they never heard the gospel message... The counterfeits came and called upon them when they needed God and led them off down the garden path into the world of the cults. Now, in the world of the cults, there are two classes of people. There are the deceivers at the top ranks. These are the ones at headquarters. These are the ones that have sometimes come out of the Christian faith and denied the Lord that saved them. Then underneath that is a whole other group. These are the deceived. So there are the deceivers and the deceived. Unless a very high-ranking cult member knocks on your door, you are dealing with the deceived. Not the deceivers. They are not willfully deceiving you. They're at your door because they believe they're serving God and that's the only way they can have salvation. Sometimes when we look at those pesky Jehovah's Witnesses, we say, Oh no, I can't stand them. Or maybe you've made the big attempt. All right, Lord, I'm going to talk to them. And it turned out to be just a big argument and a frustration. Did you notice that everything you said to them just bounced back off of them? Uh Aha, something was not right. Now, I'm telling you this from experience. I made lots of mistakes in the beginning, too. When I came to Christ, oh boy, was I going to win the Jehovah's Witnesses. But what happened was I won every argument, but I never won anyone for Christ. And I said, Lord, what am I doing wrong? I don't want to win arguments. I want to win souls for Christ. And the Lord showed me that I was fighting spiritual battles with fleshly weapons. People in the cults are not demon-possessed, but they are under a spirit of deception. There's a difference. 
so that when you talk to them, it just ricochets off this deceptive spirit. The Lord told me, you have authority as a Christian, why don't you use it? And I thought, well, what do you mean? Then the Holy Spirit began to bring scriptures to me. I give you the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Right? Do we use that authority? Matthew 18, 18 to 20, I'd always breeze by it without giving it much thought. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It took a while of seeking and praying, but it finally got through to me that I was in a spiritual battle and I was fighting with the best fleshly weapons I had, my intellect, my knowledge of scripture, my ability to talk faster than they did. But that just won arguments. It didn't win souls. Then I learned how to do it God's way. And believe me, God's way is better. You take, you pray before you ever talk to the people. Don't attempt to pray with cultists. Jehovah's Witnesses will not pray with you. They feel you're praying to a freakish looking three-headed God. They want no part of it. It just upsets them. Don't do it. You don't pray with them. When Mormons come to you and say, let's just bow our head to Heavenly Father, those of you that saw the film know they're praying to an exalted man from the planet Kolob. That is not our Heavenly Father. You do not bow your head with Mormons to their false god with an exalted body of flesh and bone and celestial wives and children. You say, this is my home. I would prefer to pray. And then you do. They won't argue with you, the Mormon elders. But don't pray with the Jehovah's Witnesses. You pray when you see them coming, or if they catch you at the door unexpectedly, I excuse myself for a moment while I plug in the tea kettle or go to the washroom or something, and when I'm there, I'm not wasting my time. I'm praying. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I take authority over this encounter. I bind that spirit of deception that watchtower deception, I loose these people to hear the gospel. And you know, I'm an overcomer in Christ. I like to tell Satan what to do. So I say, Satan, you've had these people long enough. From this moment forward, they are going to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of the truth of the gospel, and they will be set free in Jesus' name. Now, this morning I want to give you a little practical advice. I'm going to lead you step by step through what to say to Jehovah's Witnesses the next time they call. I call this presenting the truth to Jehovah's Witnesses. And this is very simple. How many people think they could handle one scripture the next time Jehovah's Witnesses call? Only one. Could you do it? Hallelujah. Good for you. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do it God's way. We're going to get prayed up. For that next encounter. Now there's no such thing as time with the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray over the next two Jehovah's Witnesses that arrive at all your doorsteps. So let's just bow our head and get ready, shall we? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we as the body of Christ this morning wish to exalt Jesus Christ in our lives. We know, Lord, that there are Jehovah's Witnesses coming to each one of our various doors, and we want to give a good witness for Jesus Christ and see these people set free. So now, in that powerful name of Jesus, over the next two Jehovah's Witnesses at our various doorsteps, we bind that spirit of watchtower deception, and we loose them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, anoint us with the Holy Spirit that we may remember what to say to them. Lord, that we may seriously be prepared in order to be the light of the world. We leave this next encounter in the care and keeping of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. You're going to see a difference the next time they come if you sincerely meant that prayer. The next two Jehovah's Witnesses who arrive at your doorstep, I want you to realize that they do not come to your home unprepared. They practice their little sermons at the Kingdom Hall. They practice with one another before they come out. 
They only know three or four scriptures, most of them, the ones they've practiced to come to your house with. Now, another thing you should know from an insider's view is that their entire presentation is based on overcoming your objections. They deliberately say things so that you will object. And then they're into an argument. And boy, are they good at arguing, hey? You all know that. Now, how are we going to diffuse that and give a witness for Christ? Well, it's done this way. You're prayed up. The next thing you do is prepare. And I mean, when you get home from church today, you do this because the Lord's going to put a pair on somebody's doorstep this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Now, you be ready. We don't want any flustering around when the Jehovah's Witnesses come. Oh, my goodness, what did that lady at church say to do? What was that scripture I was supposed to use? I can't remember. No, none of that. Because you're going to be prepared. They're prepared. You be prepared. Right? Now, the first thing you do is mark down this scripture. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Now, I'm going to suggest that what you do, when you get home today, you take a Bible out of your cupboard that you know you don't really use very often. It's just sitting there, uh, collecting dust, maybe. Uh, When you open your Bible, you bring to church, everything falls out. We all know that. So take a Bible that you can leave by your door. Now, in that Bible, you put a bookmark in at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Now that's going to be all ready. When the Jehovah's Witnesses arrive, there's no flustering around. You're prayed up. you got your scripture marked. And in the back of that Bible, you're going to stop at our table and pick up a tract or two or some little booklets or something that you're going to be prepared to give them, and you're going to put it in the back of the Bible. Then you close the whole thing up and say, Lord, bring them on. I'm ready. And set it by the door. Now you do that all ahead of time. So there's no flustering about when the witnesses arrive. They're prepared. You be prepared. Okay? There they are at your door. Knock, knock, knock. And you open the door. And there they are. Now, they're going to give you probably one of three presentations. Aren't world conditions dreadful? Hmm? Mm Mm-hmm. They're trying to find out if you're in as much fear as they are. Or they'll say, I'd like to talk to you about the Lord's Prayer. And of course, when they get to thy kingdom come, they want to talk about the Watchtower Kingdom and things like that. Uh, Or they will, you know, say something provocative. Now, you, as the Christian, are going to diffuse all their argumentativeness by being very pleasant and letting them get through. They'll never rest till they get through those three or four scriptures they've prepared. So what we want to do is get them through it as fast as we can so we can present the gospel to them, right? Now, the first thing you do when you open the door is, hello, we're missionaries uh, presenting the good news of the kingdom or something like this. You, with a big Christian smile, say, oh... Is it ever nice to see you here this morning? My name is Jane Christian, and your names are... And they'll give their names. Now, try and remember, because afterwards you can look them up in the phone book. They live in your district. Send us their address, and we can mail them Christian literature. (laughs) Plus, you will have their name to pray for them. Okay? So that's... Our our little mail-out campaign, they never know your name. They never know where their name came from. We take all the flack, but we also get all the blessings of souls that are saved through this outreach. We have the sheets our back table for you to fill in their names, so help yourself to some. It's called, What Can I Do About the Cults? All right? They're so surprised that you're so nice and friendly, but just be friendly. So they'll say, We're calling this morning to talk about the kingdom. And they'll look at you and you smile and say, please go on. And they'll try and say something to provoke you. Don't you think it's about time God set up a government on this earth? Now you might have a few opinions on that. Bite your tongue. Please go on. And then they'll say, 
You know, it's certainly true all the churches today are corrupt. Boy, you'd like to answer that one. I mean to tell you down at our church, we're not, no, 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 don't argue, smile. Please go on. Please continue. Well, they're so surprised by this that they have to go on to the next verse. And then on to the next verse, and lo and behold, five, six minutes, they're finished. They've said everything they came to say. They got through their sermon, so there's only one thing left to do, and that's offer you the literature. We'd like you to have our, whatever the offer is this month, a book or the watchtower, whatever it is. And you just keep smiling and being friendly. You don't even have to let them in the house for this presentation. You can do it all on the doorstep. So then you say, you know, you people have come to my door today because you really believe you're in the true faith. You got that? You people have come to my door today because you really believe you're in the true faith. Is this right? And they'll say something like, yes, of course. And they might even say to you, because if you were in the true faith, you'd be out knocking on doors. Now, you just swallow that because you deserve it. Okay? You say, well, you believe you're in the true faith, and yet I believe I'm in the true faith, and we don't believe alike. So I think that there's only one thing to do this morning. We'll just have to take the Bible test and see which of us is in the true faith. Whereupon you reach for your Bible, it miraculously falls open, at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, the Jehovah's Witnesses will be so impressed to meet somebody that knows a scripture or two. Let me tell you. You open up the Bible, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, and you read to them, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. You know, the Word of God is so powerful. You look at them and you say, Do you pass this Bible test of being in the true faith? Is Jesus Christ in you? Whereupon they will backpedal so fast they'll almost fall off your porch. No, no, no. Jesus Christ can't be in you. You see, that's only for the 144,000 who go to heaven, but we hope to live on earth. We, we can't have Jesus Christ in us. You know, we have our salvation by association with God's organization, blah, blah, blah. And you say, uh, they'll also say, in fact, our Bible doesn't even say that. And that's true. Their Bible has not only altered or distorted every reference to the deity of Christ, but it has also distorted every scripture saying Christ is in you. Now you're going to sweetly smile and say something that's going to start them searching. You say to them, well, you know, if you would go and look in your purple Bible, that's their interlinear Bible. If you would go and look in your purple Bible, you'd find out that it really does say Jesus Christ is in you. And it doesn't say here whether it's heavenly or earthly class. It says if you're in the true faith, you'll have Jesus Christ in you. Now, I'm happy to tell you, ladies or gentlemen, this morning, that I know I'm in the true faith because I passed this Bible test. Jesus Christ is in me, and let me tell you how it happened. Whereupon you wax eloquent with your personal testimony. They may try to escape. So you say, oh, excuse me, did I not stand and listen politely to you for six minutes? Well, yes, you did. Well, then I'm asking you to please stand and listen politely to me for the same amount of time. And they will. They're very fair-minded people. They'll say, yeah, that seems right to us. You didn't interrupt them. So if they try to interrupt, you say, excuse me, did I not allow you to make your presentation? I would like to make mine. And now I say to Pentecostal people especially, leave out healing, tongues, and try not to say cross too often. These terms are like raising, uh, putting a red flag in front of a bull. You deal with the indwelling Christ and the time of your actual conversion. They've got to walk before they can run. 
Tell them about how you received Christ into your life. And you can say, well, my testimony is maybe not very exciting. It's your personal testimony and we're to be witnesses for Christ and that is your witness. Don't use somebody else's. Use your own. How you receive Christ. And if you can work in one more scripture somewhere in your presentation to them, use Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You can have it marked in the Bible even. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, not as a result of works, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. You know what to emphasize. Hmm? Now, at this point, you've given your testimony... We all have a spirit of discernment. Let's use it. During the time you are speaking to them, you will, chances are, have one strong, militant Jehovah's Witness. It's the organization all the way. Nothing else could be right. And you'll have one little trainee. Now, as you're speaking to them, look at them. Not with your own eyes, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you'll notice one of them flicking an eyelid. Or you'll notice a look of conviction on their faces. And it isn't always the new ones. Sometimes the old ones are convicted too. And at that point you must make a decision. Do I want to talk to these people again? Did I notice any kind of a response? And bear in mind that we walk by faith and not by sight. We have prayed and bound that spirit of watchtower deception. We have loosed them to hear the gospel of Christ. You have shared about the indwelling Christ. You have started them searching in their interlinear Bible. You've done all these things. And you've shared Christ and him crucified. And what he means personally to you. They can't have a personal relationship with Christ. This is very appealing to them. To think that Christ would be personally interested in them rather than through Watchtower headquarters. At this point, you must make a decision. If you want them to come back so you can witness some more, or you want to witness again to Jehovah's Witnesses, then you must take their literature. That's the only way to get them back. As soon as you take their literature, even if it's just one Watchtower magazine, on the territory record card that they keep, they will write down your address. If they've got your name, they'll put it there, and they'll put what they placed with you. Now, even if these two don't come back, and they probably will because they call back on all their literature placements without fail. They're required to do that. Even if they don't come back, the next witness receiving that territory card, and they rotate about every three months, We'll see, oh, here's a house that took literature. I'm going there. Now, some Christian people say to me, well, you know what I do? I just invite them in. I keep them there all morning. I tell them about Jesus. I talk to them. That keeps them from calling on all my neighbors. How right they are. Most witnesses only go out in the service once a week. And you've protected your neighborhood. In fact, we have a program called Neighborhood Concern that we ask all Christians to participate with us. And what that is, is that we ask each one of you to take responsibility for your own neighborhoods. You watch out the window, and if you see the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons going into any house, then you know those people in that house are in crisis. They are seeking for God. Their marriage is in trouble. They have sickness there. Some child is giving them problems. They are seeking for God. Now, I mean what I say that if you will just, in the name of Jesus, go over and say, you know, I'm your neighbor from across the street. I've noticed that you've been letting the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses in. I know that you must be a person with a heart for God. I'm afraid that you may get it, be getting involved in something that you don't understand. 
I have some literature here, and we have the literature you can give them to show what the real teachings of this group are. Many Christians participating in neighborhood concern lead their neighbors to Christ on the first visit. Many times these people break down in tears and say, I thought nobody cared. I've lived in this neighborhood ten years, nobody has called on me. And many times you can just bring them to Christ and into the church and they're functioning as Christians. How much better than having them have years of their life go down the tube in the Witnesses and Mormons and then we got to get them out and deprogram them with the Word of God, wash them, clean them up, get them functioning in the church. How much better to avoid all that and get right to the nitty-gritty and introduce them to Christ? Don't you agree? And it really works. If you haven't got the nerve to call on those people, then I'm sure your pastor or some of the other spiritual people in the church would go and do it. If nothing else, you send us their address so we can send them literature. But just don't leave them to be drawn into those cult groups. You take spiritual responsibility for your neighborhood. Now back to the two witnesses at your door. You noticed a little flicker of the eyelid, or you thought, hey, this went so well and I feel so good, I'm ready for the next bunch. So you take their literature and you say to them, uh, rather than pay for it, I wonder if I could exchange literature with you. And you take theirs and you hand them some of ours that's written for them. Now, bear in mind the tract assortments for Jehovah's Witnesses. Some are written for you, some are written for them. You don't give them the whole assortment. You take it apart and you'll see which ones are written for who. Some are for you, instructions to you, some are to give out to the witnesses at the door. Now they'll say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm sorry, we can't take hate literature. You know, that's one of the funniest things. They're willing to give you a Watchtower magazine that says your pastor, your church is of the devil, and all of you are going to bite the dust at Armageddon. And that's not hateful. But when you want to give them literature exalting the person of Jesus Christ, that's hateful. You know, that shows how they're thinking, how deceived they are. And you just say to them, oh... I didn't know that this was hateful. I got this at church, and you know, I was just waiting for the next two Jehovah's Witnesses to come so that they could check this out and tell me if it's true or not. They can't resist checking it out. They're hoping to find something wrong with it. But exchange your literature on that basis. They'll generally take it. You're not being hostile. You're not saying, here, take this. This will straighten you out, you cultist. You know, you're being nice about it. So anyway, you hand it to them, and you take theirs, and it's almost friendly, and away they go, and barely does the door close before you're on your knees praying. Holy Spirit, convict them of what they have heard today. Never let them alone. Now, you're fighting spiritual battles with spiritual weapons, right? It wasn't so hard, was it? I've had Christians who have never been able to witness for Christ, and, and they say to me, Do you know I felt so good after? I just felt so wonderful after I did that. I actually spoke up effectively for Christ. Now, lo and behold, you've taken their literature, you've given them yours, your name is down for a back call, and back they come. Now, sometimes... They won't let the trainee come back. They bring in the big guns, hey? But you don't care. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I've sat down with six, eight of their top elders just right at me and just had the most wonderful time because Jesus Christ and you are a majority in any situation. Now, back they come. So you have to have another little presentation ready. And this little presentation is for the back calls. That one is for at the door, and then they're coming back. And you've been praying for them in the meantime. And maybe you've sent us their name and address, and we've slipped them some literature, you know, things like that. The Lord is, is aware, and we pray over all our letters that the Holy Spirit go with it. And we've had some amazing results off these mail-outs. Now, the next time they come back, there they are, knock, knock, knock on your door. You open the door, and again, you've been praying. You're all prayed up, not to worry. Welcome. Come on in. You know, I so enjoyed our discussion last time. 
Please sit down. I'll plug the kettle in. You're in the kitchen. Oh, God. You know, praying. Okay. Back out you come. And this time, they'll try and, and offer you a Bible study or something like this. And you just be very pleasant. If you have to go through the please go on, please go on, please go on, do it. And let them get their little spiel over with. After all, they practice it. They're determined to use it. And then you say something like this. Do you know God loved us so much? Every time I think of the love of God, that he actually came down to this earth, became a man, and died for us, how wonderful! They can't stand this. Because Jesus Christ, to them, is the first creation of God. He's the Archangel Michael. He's a secondary God. And here you're saying, Almighty God came down to earth, became a man, and died for us. They can't stand it. So they say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm afraid you're mistaken. Jesus Christ is not God. He is definitely not Almighty God. And you say, oh, well, I wonder if I could share a few scriptures with you that call Jesus Christ Almighty God. And they'll say, there are no such scriptures in the Bible. And you say, well, then, would you mind looking at them? And, and if that doesn't, you know, if that's not what it says, maybe you could explain what it says. You see, you must never preach at Jehovah's Witnesses. You must ask questions. You must, you know, not be too forceful. You must say, well, let's let the Bible speak. And I want you to remember that it is not you that convicts people of sin. That is not your job. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. You bear witness, and your talking is okay, but the Word of God is better. And you don't jump all over 10,000 subjects. They'll try to say, oh yeah, if you're a Christian, how come Lutherans killed Lutherans in the last war? And you say, we're not discussing the last war. We're discussing whether or not Jesus is Almighty God. Well, the cross is a pagan symbol. Well, we're not going to discuss the cross today. We're going to discuss whether Jesus is Almighty God. You see how we're diffusing it? Bring them back to Jesus. All these other subjects may be interesting, but we've got to present Jesus Christ to them. Now you say to them, let's, let's just turn to Revelation. Now this presentation is so easy for you to remember. This is your back call presentation to them. And you might want to have your Bible marked up and be prepared. I call this presentation the first and the last. Because it uses the terms first and last. And it uses only the first and last chapters of Revelation. Isn't this simple? You sit down with them and you say... Well, look at Revelation 1, verse 8, and let's see what it says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And say, now, who would that be speaking about? And the Jehovah's Witnesses will instantly say, it's speaking about Jehovah God. They've even got Jehovah inserted in their Bible, although it's not there in the Greek. But we're not going to be contentious. We're going to say, well, actually, really in the Greek it says, Lord God. And at this moment, let's just say, well, you say it's Jehovah, but I think it's Jesus. And I want to share with you the reason why. But... As we look at this scripture, let's just look at the terminology. The Alpha and the Omega says he's the Lord God. He says he is, he was, and he's coming, and he's the Almighty. I sometimes smile at them and say, who's coming? Are you expecting Jehovah God to come? And they'll say, they know perfectly well Jesus is coming. They'll say, well, Jesus Christ comes as an agent of Jehovah God, actually. It is Jehovah God coming and, and you know, his chief agent, you know, and all this. I just say, oh, all right, okay, let's just leave that. But let's see if we can find out who the Alpha and Omega is from Scripture. Not your opinion, not my opinion, but let's let the Bible speak. So you turn over to Revelation 22. And you say, in this chapter of Scripture, there are several speakers. But one of the speakers is this Alpha and Omega, 
And we know it's him because he says he's coming quickly. And you notice here in verse 12, he's speaking, and the speaker doesn't change from verse 12 through verse 14. He says this, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Now underline that first and last. The beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. Verse 15, outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, immoral persons, murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. So he says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I'm root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. He's testifying that he's the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I, Jesus. Verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, the witnesses will say, well, this can't be. Jesus can't be the Alpha and Omega. He just can't be. Now, you'll understand their consternation because they've been told this can't be by their so-called God's organization. So you say, well, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter is established. They know this scripture. And say, notice that here in Revelation 22... In verse 13, the one speaking says, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Now, we've proven here that it's Jesus calling himself the Alpha and Omega. Let's see who the first and the last is, and then we'll know for sure we're right. You turn back to Revelation chapter 1. And beginning in verse 13, there is a vision of the Son of Man. Now, the witnesses know the Son of Man is Jesus Christ. There will be no argument at all about that. And you can read down in the vision if you want. But when you get to verse 17, what does John say? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Who was dead? They will never admit it was Jehovah God. It's the Son of Man. It's Jesus Christ. The first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Scripture is clear. That's who the Alpha and Omega, first and last, beginning and end is, Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to Revelation 1, verse 8, and let's put this in its context. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, Jesus Christ, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. End of presentation. At this time, the witnesses will jump up and say, we have another appointment. Justified lying. I always say, who is your appointment with? Where are you going? And they go, hub, 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 or they each burst out with a different answer. And I say, you know, you really don't have another appointment. But I want you to know this morning that Jesus Christ is God Almighty and nothing less. Now at this point you should have one of the tracts on who Jesus Christ is, the little booklet, Could Jesus Be a God? They say he's a God, we say he's Almighty God. Either they're right and we're wrong, or we're right and they're wrong, or we're both wrong, we better get into the Word of God and find out. Be pleasant like, you know, 
to them like this and make it appear that we better all just search and find out who he is. Now, when they leave this time, again, take their literature. This bunch, you've stirred them up so bad that they probably won't come back. If they do come back after this encounter, they're on their way to becoming Christians. Without a doubt, if you've been faithful to pray, the Holy Spirit will be convicting them. Many times I've had them call me up, and it doesn't happen instantly. Sometimes three, four, five, six months go by. They come back and say, I haven't had a night's sleep since I talked to you. That's not me. That's the Holy Spirit convicting them. That's his job, not yours. Our job is to bear witness. Now, that's not too dreadfully hard, is it? Using the first and the last chapters of Revelation to show them who the first and the last is? And away they go. And you're praying. And, you know, bear in mind that one plants, another waters, God makes it grow. You may only get a chance to bear the first part of the witness, but they'll call on someone else in your town and the next person will bear witness. I tell you, if people had talked to me like this when I was a Jehovah's Witness, it would have blown me away. And yet, praise God, the body of Christ is raising up and bearing witness to these people. And the Jehovah's Witnesses are absolutely stagnating here in B.C. They can't bring them in the front door fast enough. The Christians are leading them to Christ out the back door. They've had to concentrate their efforts in Australia. And then we went over there and put a big crimp in their style over there. But we can't do it alone. The body of Christ has to do it. Our job is to help you be trained and then... You get out in the mission field. After all, many of you probably wanted to be a missionary or serve the Lord, and here you got a mission field walking right up to your door. How convenient. They buy the gas. You don't have to leave home. It's wonderful. Now, I'm going to give you one more simple little presentation. Because they might come back. Or another group will come back, and you know they've already heard the first and the last, although it doesn't hurt them to hear it again. It doesn't hurt them to hear about the indwelling Christ again. But one of their all-time favorite topics is prophecy, isn't it? Oh my, they think they got the last word on prophecy, notwithstanding the fact that they've missed the date for the end of the world about six times. And would you believe they're gearing up to set another date? The rumors we get out of Brooklyn, New York, they're gearing up for another date. Because every time they set a date, their membership goes up. When it fails, it falls back down again. They have to give a few years so people forget. Then they set another one and go through the whole exercise again. So this time they're at your door and they're talking about the dreadful world conditions and the end of everything. And So you can say to them, you know, I'm so interested in Bible prophecy myself. One of my favorite topics. And you say, you know, I was just reading the most interesting prophecies in Zechariah. Here again, it's a simple two-scripture presentation. You pray first, you bind that spirit of deception, they catch you unawares, you go in the other room and do it, and back you come, and you have your Bible marked for Zechariah. Now that's pretty close to the New Testament. It's a good book of prophecy. And we're going to have marked... Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13, and Zechariah 12, verse 10. Now, you'll notice that in all these presentations, we're stressing the deity of Jesus Christ. Yes, I know Jesus was called the Son of Man, Son of God. But the cult groups all say this, and they're thinking of something entirely different. What we have to show is that Jesus Christ was God incarnate in the flesh. And if we can show a Jehovah's Witness that he was Jehovah God incarnate in the flesh, Jesus is Almighty God, you shake them to the very foundations of their watchtower theology. So you say, you know, I was just reading these prophecies in Zechariah. My, they're so wonderful. To think that Almighty God Jehovah cared enough for us 
that he allowed himself to be sold for 30 pieces of silver and pierced through for our transgressions. <gasps> They'll go. Can't stand that. Oh, Jehovah never did that. Well, then let's read this prophecy. Uh, you tell me what it means if it doesn't mean that. Smile. Always smile. Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13, and where your Bible says L-O-R-D in capitals, this is the Tetragrammaton. Now, I'm fully aware the name Jehovah is not correct, and it's only been in use the last 700 years. It was never used by the Jews. It was never used by God himself. It was never used by Jesus Christ or the early church. It was Jews put L-O-R-D, Adonai, Lord, but where your Bible says that, when dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, I always put the name Jehovah back in. Okay? So let's look at what Jehovah says here in Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. And I said to them, If it's good in your sight, give me my wages. But if not, never mind. So they weighed out... 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then Jehovah said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Who was valued and sold for 30 pieces of silver? We know it was Jesus, but Jehovah says, it was me. I was sold. I was valued for 30 pieces of silver. Devastating to Jehovah's Witness theology. It gets worse or better, depending which side you're on. We go on to Zechariah 12, verse 10. And we read these words of Jehovah. And I will pour out on the house of David... And on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. But Jehovah says, they will look on me whom they have pierced. In your margin, you can write in John 19.37 if you want to carry on with one final scripture because that applies this scripture to Jesus. Who was pierced for our transgressions? Who was sold for 30 pieces of silver? Jehovah says it was him. And yet we know it was Jesus Christ, the Word, become flesh among us. There's several other good scriptures you can add to this if you wish. Acts 20, 28 says that God purchased the church with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. These are devastating scriptures to a Jehovah's Witness, so we want to use them. These are the scriptures they never deal with in their magazines. In fact, in their Bible, they've changed the word me in this scripture. They will look on me whom they have pierced to the word him. But they forgot to change the one about the 30 pieces of silver. But you can say, check any other Bible. The word is me. It's me in Hebrew, not him. And so this again gets them looking, casting a few questions about their Bible. So with Jehovah's Witnesses, we need to use the strong weapon of the Word of God. We know that the Word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God is our powerful, powerful weapon. And we don't want to fight without the Word of God in our hands. And yet you don't have to be an absolute expert in the Word of God in order to pick it up and use it. You just need a few thrusts of the sword. You need to put this Word of God 
to the Jehovah's Witness and then let the Word of God and the Holy Spirit do their job. You've done yours. It's like Hebrews 4, verse 12, which says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Do you realize how powerful that Word of God is? It's not just words on paper. It's alive. It's active. It can judge the thoughts and intentions of their heart. Now, it may appear that the Jehovah's Witnesses are unaffected by what you say. In fact, watch out if they protest too much. All this has done is make me a stronger Jehovah's Witness. I don't believe that. You're using it out of context, blah, blah, blah. The more they protest, the madder they get, the more convicted they are. So never look at it. Sometimes I've had encounters with Jehovah's Witnesses and I've said, Oh, Lord, forgive me for wasting my time and yours. I never met such a, you know, boneheaded individual. And I'm feeling bad about it. And yet, unbeknownst to me, the Holy Spirit begins to work on that person. And several months down the road, we hear about them. They've called on another Christian, and they've said, You know, I haven't slept since I talked to that Lori McGregor. She's shot my nerves. It's the Holy Spirit dealing with them. And as we keep talking to them door after door, Christian after Christian, we wear them down, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them, and Christians have had the experience of having Jehovah's Witnesses come back and say, I've never forgotten the way you spoke to me, how nice you were to me in your home. And you know, I know I'm missing something in my life. And is it really possible I could have a personal relationship with Christ? And they're just so ready to come to the Lord. And so, bear this in mind. We'll reap and we'll take in the harvest if we don't tire out. I know it isn't the easiest mission field in the world. But it's got to be one of the most rewarding. Let me tell you, when you see those ones that were formerly witnesses, when they come into your church and get a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God fills them with the Holy Spirit after they get over their initial prejudice against it, I tell you, they'll fill up your church. Because they'll say, if I serve the devil that long, not knowing what I was doing, I'm going to serve God twice as hard. And they do. They'll be some of the best people that you can have in your church. Faithful, obedient to the Lord, an example to all. Because in the beginning, they were people really seeking for God. They meant business with God when they got into those cults. And they really mean business with God when they come out. And so I want to encourage you with that. Now, the original of this cassette was produced by McGregor Ministries. Box 1215, Delta, B.C., Canada, V4M, 3T3. This message is not copyrighted, and we encourage duplication and distribution for the purpose of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please write to us if you would like a catalog of teaching tapes and literature to enable you to witness effectively to those who are in the various cult groups. Our address again is McGregor Ministries, Box 1215, Delta, B.C., Canada, V4M, 3T3. Our address in Australia is McGregor Ministries, Box 201, Mount Gravatt, Queensland, 4122. In the United States, McGregor Ministries, Box 580, Point Roberts, Washington, USA, 98281. Thank you.